Well, <clears throat> good morning. I'm glad that some people came back to hear the talk, and, and uh, I'm really grateful to be here in Cambridge a second time, and wanted to thank the Howard Foundation and the organizers for inviting me to, to be here and be able to speak about some of the work that we have done on analyzing uh, carotenoids and, and also tocopherols in the brain. Um, so the, the, the topic is differing xanthophyll content in regions of elderly brain. Um, this is, well, there's the title slide, okay. The uh, co-authors are, are Dennis Gearhard and Kathy Dory. Um, they've, from the time that this actually began, uh, they've all changed organizations. And from when we first di did some of the brain analysis work, it was probably six or seven years before the first publication came out. Um, some of the information that I'm presenting now, there's a publication that's, that's in progress. And so you can see we started this over 15 years ago and we're just now trying to publish one of the papers that's related to the work. What I'd like to talk about some is uh, xanthophils and carotenoids. Um, because there was so much yesterday on structures and things like that, I won't do a lot of uh, uh, information on that. Um, methods of analysis, there are multiple types of analysis that can be done by HPLC. This area has evolved over the, the 15, 20 years since we started doing some of this. Um, transport and why they might enter the brain. And this is gonna be kind of speculative because I think that in talking with Paul and some others that we know they get there, but we don't necessarily know the details of exactly how they get there. And I think Paul and others are working on things like transport proteins, et cetera, that are probably involved. I'll discuss the initial study that we did, some results, and then I wanna to touch on uh, uh, analysis that we've done recently in the last two years. Um, it's the Rush Memory and Aging Project, or MAP. Um, mm -hmm. The data has not been statistically worked up, so I'll just give some information on concentrations in the different regions for some of the xanthophils. Talk about some of the things we did on methodology for that project because one of the key areas of interest was actually tocopherols, tocotrienols, not so much the carotenoids. That was kind of a, if you can do it, we'd like to see that. And then chiral separation, which uh, there's been some discussion of that. Uh, and then just the content of the, the brain sections from that study. So uh, xanthophils are essentially a class of carotenoids that contain at least an oxygen functional group. Uh, for lutein and zeaxanthin, the difference is really uh, just the positioning of one double bond in the molecule. Sorry that these are actually, they're flipped. When I looked at my structures, I was doing slides until about 1.30 last night. Um, but what that does is that actually for, for zeaxanthin, there end up being two chiral centers, and you get as far as optical isomers are concerned, you get two to the N. Because this is a symmetrical molecule, mesozeaxanthin is the same regardless of whether that isomer is, whether you have a, an RS here versus here, it's the same molecule. So you end up with three optical isomers that, that result from this. And some structures of other carotenoids that uh, are common and a number of these uh, appear in the brain and they all look very similar except some have oxygen groups, some might have a, a methyl group substituted on there. Um, the amount that's in the brain is probably the thing that's of interest because it doesn't tend to follow what we see in the serum. So let me, uh, I'll, I'll say this, I'm so happy that the neuroscientists we're up here explaining everything about the brain. I'm basically a nutrition scientist that's become more analytical chemist over the years. And so I'm gonna talk a little bit about these separations, not going to into detail. I know some people here have very strong backgrounds in this, but there are really two or three when you include chiral um, major types of HPLC, reverse phase. And what we have there is it separates compounds by partitioning the compound into the, the phase in the column that it passes through. 
polar components elute or come off the column first. And the most frequently used columns for carotenoid analysis are C18 or C30. Um, I was actually involved when I worked at NIST in developing the C30 column that's used for carotenoids. Um, my office mate was a stationary phase chemist and we worked together on that. Um, normal phase liquid chromatography actually was around for a long time. It was um, based upon adsorption, where polar surfaces adsorb to the, the stationary phase. And as a result of that, the polar components hold longer and they come out last. So to put this in perspective, the xanthophylls come off the column first, followed by beta carotene and alpha carotene lycopene on this. In this type of separation, which makes use of silica columns, diol, cyano, or amino, the polar compounds are held longer, so the xanthophylls come off last. You tend to get a better separation of the xanthophylls this way. The C30 column is a little unique because it was designed for some of these separations. And then I'll mention chiral columns because particularly for carotenoids, which have um, carbons that are chiral centers, and we, we frequently think of these as mirror images. Uh, I think George had mentioned whether the, the bond is up or down basically in one position. Um, they have the ability to rotate light to the left or the right. And there are now um, specific columns that have molecules bound to them that recognize these chiral centers. It used to be that you would have to derivatize your molecules with a chiral component so that it could separate by a normal phase chromatography. Now they have these compounds bound and uh, we use them to separate astaxanthin optical isomers, vitamin E optical isomers, and zeaxanthin optical isomers. So <clears throat> how and why xanthophylls enter the brain? And as I said, this is probably more speculative than it would be explaining what's going on. Um, we know that the xanthophylls are primarily associated with uh, HDL particles in, in the blood. So, you know, they've got, a, they've got a bus to transport them around in the blood and get them to the brain. If you read a lot of papers, they comment that there's, they, they pass the blood-brain border, which is true. They do pass the blood-brain border because we see an array of carotenoids in the brain. Um, However, it, it's obviously not a transparent uh, means of getting across because there's some discrimination. The level in other tissues in the body isn't reflected in the brain, and the proportion that gets across, okay, so absolute level of a tissue in the body relative to the brain, the brain's much lower. And then proportions of xanthophylls are much higher in the brain relative to what is transported in the serum. So, um, there, and it's different from the eye because in the case of the eye, there's very selective uptake of a couple of carotenoids, uh, particularly lutein zeaxanthin. And if mesozeaxanthin was transported in the blood, uh, it would probably be taken up also based upon the, the non-selectivity of the, the binding protein. Um, so I think there's a lot of potential work that needs to be done here to really understand how these are being transported across selectively, and yet we do see uh, an array of carotenoids in the brain. Okay, so the brain has lots of polar lipid, and I overheard John Erdman uh, earlier today speaking and saying uh, that they had wor were working out analysis in the brain, and it's just an absolutely terrible tissue to work with to try to run these things, and, and it is. It's the, the lipids that are in there are a mess, and so all the things that we tend to do to try to remove those to make it a better sample to run for analysis, many times don't work. You end up with some type of precipitate. A lot of those might be sterol-related compounds or other polar lipids. Um, so it, it does kind of provide a target location. Carotenoids like lipids. You know, whenever people have uh, taken too much carotenoids, it tends to deposit in lipophilic tissues or lipid tissues of the body, palms of the hand and things. Um, and carotenoids are known to associate with membranes. Uh, I think it was, I'm trying to remember whether it was uh, John Landrum's paper, but uh, one looked at the association of xanthophylls in the membrane and 
Lutein and zeaxanthin actually associate differently in membranes, and there's lots of membranes in the brain, and they could uh, possibly have a functional role there. Functional roles, I think that all the neuroscientists and folks like uh, Billy and Lisa and whoever, they're working some of that out. I'm, I'm just an analytical chemist, basically, at this point. But we know the brain has high oxygen content, and we also know that carotenoids serve as antioxidants. So that is potentially one role that they might serve there. We know that, that carotenoids are involved in cellular communication. I mean, there's no more cellular communication going on than what occurs in the brain uh, versus the rest of the body. We heard from Tos and others that they serve an anti-inflammatory role. So is it possible that the presence of uh, carotenoids or xanthophils in the brain may be preventing uh, inflammatory processes that, that promote age-related macular degeneration, or excuse me, Alzheimer's disease and cognitive dysfunction? Um, so I think this is more questions to be answered than it is answers to questions. The, this is just a slide of composition of uh, the brain. The brain is a lot of water, but you also see that there are a, there's a significant amount of fats. And uh, a number of these, as I said, are very polar lipids. The other thing that this slides out, slide points out is that there are differences between gray matter and white matter. Um, the, the neuroscientists that were here pointed out some of the differences between the regions of the brain and what they, what they serve as far as uh, processing data and why some areas might be more susceptible to Alzheimer's disease or, or cognitive decline than others. Um, and one of the things that, we, that I'll point out that we did in this study, probably just serendipitous, is that we did separate out gray matter and white matter. And uh, you notice that there's a difference in the, the water content, and there is a difference in the lipid content. Actually, the white matter tends to have more lipids there. So the design of the, the study, there is a paper published. It was in uh, 2004. We actually did this work in, I think, about 98. And we published values on just carotenoid levels in the brain. But we also had brain from not just what we call healthy elderly, in this case, instead of controls, we're using that term. Um, we also had brain from uh, brains that were diagnosed as Alzheimer's by microscopy. And in the process, we had 28 sections of brain that were obtained from the Harvard Brain Tissue Resource Center. Nine of the donors had Alzheimer's disease and five were healthy elderly. Uh, there was a section from the frontal region and the, uh, which was considered to be a more vulnerable area. So we're using vulnerable V and one from the occipital, which is supposed to represent a less vulnerable region as far as Alzheimer's disease is concerned. Once these were thawed, they were dissected into gray, G, and white matter. We had a total of 56 samples that were analyzed. We didn't have any matching blood samples. We didn't have any food consumption data. This was the, the first that this had been done. We didn't even know if we'd be able to make the measurements, to be honest. Uh, we knew that there was carotenoid in the brain because there's a report from a, a Russian group and also Mickey Matthews Roth had shown total carotenoids in brain. So uh, this is a diagram of the brain. You, you have seen this in some previous slides. Um, here's the frontal region, the occipital region. And um, so the reason for choosing those, again, is one's more likely to possibly be affected than, than the other based upon whether your vision is involved, we'll say, versus your memory is involved. So to go through the, the basics back then, Again, things have changed a lot, but we received the brain sections. This was a fair amount of tissue. We had one to three grams of tissue. It was homogenized with, with water. Um, the samples were saponified for 60 minutes in the presence of pyrogallol. I will make a comment here that we use pyrogallol rather than BHT because there's an artifact that can form when BHT is, is saponified. And the folks at Hoffman LaRoche identified this back um, when I was at NIST in the 80s and 90s. And it actually forms a polymer, and one of those, or one or more of those components show up in the chromatogram. So we've tended to exclude BHT from all of our analysis because of that. 
Um, they were extracted uh, three times with mixtures of hexane ethyl acetate. Combined extract was washed with water to try to remove some of the, the soaps and things that formed from the saponification. It was then partitioned between methanol, 50% uh, methanol and hexane to try to remove some more polar components. The carotenoids would stay in the hexane and there's poor solubility in alcohol, water, mixtures of carotenoids. We refrigerated it to freeze out the sterols because there's just a lot of, again, polar, polar lipids that are present in there. And then uh, it, the hexane was evaporated under nitrogen, dissolved in ethyl acetate because you still have to get the lipid into solution first and then you dilute it into a less or a more polar solvent for injection on the HPLC. I'm gonna try to keep moving. These were the conditions that we used back then. It was isocratic, C18. Um, the, we used visible detection at 450 nanometers. We used fluorescence for uh, vitamin A and for tocopherols and this was external standard. And this is a chromatogram that we generated at that time. So you see lutein, zeaxanthin, a peak that we identified as anhydrolutein. It's not confirmed what oxidation product of lutein that might be. Alpha cryptoxanthin, beta cryptoxanthin, lycopene, alpha carotene, beta carotene, cis beta carotene. And, and bear in mind, this is almost 15 to 20 years old, but it was still a decent separation. And then a number of unknown compounds, polar compounds. Um, what you see from this, and I, I didn't include a slide of the hierarchy, but basically we found beta cryptoxanthin to be the single most prominent carotenoid followed closely by lutein. And, and while lutein's taller, the peak is much narrower, so we're integrating the area under the peak. And then uh, what you find is that things in the serum that are usually high, lycopene and beta carotene, are much lower proportionally in the brain. Um, Keep going. So here are the results of the study. Uh, we did find a number of significant differences, and, and here we're comparing um, AD to healthy brain and gray matter versus white matter. These are the significant differences between Alzheimer's disease and healthy elderly. We find a significant uh, decrease in lutein in Alzheimer's, a significant decrease in zeaxanthin, the combination of the two, the peak that we call anhydrolutein. Interestingly, lycopene did show up slightly in this case. Retinol and alpha tocopherol were very, very strong. When we compared gray matter and white matter, we had very strong differences between gray and white for lutein and zeaxanthin, uh, and you see that not significant differences for a number of other carot carotenoids and vitamins that were present. And then looking at the region of the brain, the uh, vulnerable versus less vulnerable, um, some, some weak, significant differences, and I appreciated what, um, I'm trying to remember who spoke earlier, was saying that basically there's decline across the brain. I mean, I think Lisa mentioned it too. There are some areas that might be more susceptible, but, but I don't know whether, oops, go back. I don't know whether looking for those differences is going to be as strong as we might think it would be for this, and, and certainly Liz has data on this too, and she's, uh, some, some of our data is a little different, but there's a lot of co uh, concordance with it. Um, this is a slide looking at the decline uh, with Alzheimer's disease. And so you see zeaxanthin has the most significant uh, decline. Uh, lutein significantly decline. The anhydrolutein peak, and here we have lycopene decrease substantially. There's not nearly as much there relative to the others. Beta cryptoxanthin, while it was the most prominent peak that we saw in this study, and you'll see later in the second study, um, we didn't see significant changes in beta cryptoxanthin. And that's kind of a good thing. You're seeing differential behavior between the, the carotenoids and the, and the xanthophils. Um, we also saw that there was a very significant correlation between lutein and zeaxanthin. Didn't matter whether it was Alzheimer's, gray matter, white matter, healthy elderly, um, these, they tend to be associated with each other in the diet to some extent, so it kind of makes sense that, that they might follow this same trajectory and path in the brain. And uh, just to present some of the, the data, there's gonna be a couple presentations, but here we have 
Alzheimer's disease in the teal color and healthy elderly in the black. And uh, what you find is that there's a significant difference for lutein between Alzheimer's and healthy elderly. There's a significant or more significant difference between gray and white matter. And so in this case, we have gray matter located with the G and white matter with the W. And so if you were to combine this and this versus this and this, there's a significant difference there. When we look at zeaxanthin, it's kind of similar things. Again, healthy elderly, Alzheimer's disease. You see all the Alzheimer's disease bars are lower here. Um, so there's a very significant uh, decrease in uh, zeaxanthin in Alzheimer's disease. And, <clears throat> excuse me, there's a, um, a significant difference between gray matter and white matter for, um, for zeaxanthin. Uh, little, again, a little different presentation, so you can see vulnerable versus, excuse me, vulnerable versus less vulnerable. And here we have that difference between, in the healthy elderly, in the um, less vulnerable tissue between gray, gray bars, and white matter. Gray and white matter is significant. Lutein significantly different here for Alzheimer's disease between gray and white matter. We come down to the more vulnerable region we have a significant difference here between gray and white matter in the Alzheimer's group, and we have a significant difference from here to here in white matter uh, based upon uh, healthy elderly versus Alzheimer's. I, ho I hope that's sort of clear in what I'm trying to explain there. Same type of thing with uh, zeaxanthin. So uh, here we have a significant difference gray matter to white matter. Uh, in less vulnerable regions, significant difference here between uh, gray and white in Alzheimer's. Here we have a significant difference between healthy elderly and Alzheimer's disease in white matter uh, of these groups. Beta cryptoxanthin, same type of slide, no differences anywhere. Lycopene, again, same type of thing, we have no differences anywhere. And uh, while I was putting this together, I came across a site which actually, boy, I'm really running out of time, <laughs> um, a site which, which showed the change in the uh, elderly brain uh, with, excuse me, with regard to gray matter. So here is a normal elderly brain, and you can see gray matter. This is uh, Alzheimer's disease brain and the gray matter loss. So, it is interesting that that's been mapped, that there is a significant change in that. Uh, I'm gonna hit a couple of slides quickly and try to get toward the end so I don't run out of time. This, this is a slide which, excuse me, gotta get back. Um, a slide which indicates brain composition going from young to elderly, gray and white matter included, and I wanted to highlight some of the differences, but it is surprising how similar the brain remains over the course of the lifespan. Uh, this is data that uh, Liz has done at, at uh, Tufts and what I wanted to indicate here, they, they have separated out the different regions. And if you look at the hierarchy of carotenoids in their data, uh, they tend to have lutein come out as the highest. And in some cases, you know, beta cryptoxanthin is right there. If we take the occipital region, uh, beta cryptoxanthin is right there with it. And so I think that while the data differs somewhat, we're kind of in the same range in that uh, we're seeing the xanthophils account for about 70% of total carotenoids in the brain. Uh, beta cryptoxanthin and lutein are the highest that are in there. Zeaxanthin is proportionally higher than it is in the blood. Um, and then this is just a slide of theirs showing uh, the xanthophils in infant brain. And one of the things, the absolute concentrations are lower and you, you don't tend to see uh, some of the same carotenoids, like beta cryptoxanthin, uh, I think tends to be uh, low, and some of the carotenoids weren't even measurable, right, Liz? So, okay, so the, the Rush Memory and Aging Project, it's a, it's a longitudinal epidemiological study. There's 1,200 people involved. Uh, the subjects have to give uh, uh, detailed clinical, or have to agree to detailed clinical evaluations. Brain sections were, that were included are ventral medial caudate, inferior temporal, midfrontal, and posterior putamen. 
The biochemical analysis was focused on tocopherols and tocotrienols, but we also were trying to get carotenoids. Uh, brain image again with some of the areas where the sections are taken. Uh, one of the things that we were trying to do is figure out what can we improve in the method? What can we do to minimize chemical artifacts, improve the extraction? And so um, also normal phase HPLC tends to separate out the, the tocotrienols better. And um, so I'm going to have to jump through things and just uh, summarize. We ended up using a diol column with a gradient. Uh, we looked at different extraction solvents and uh, we found that no one solvent worked for everything. We had to use a series or a combination of solvents. Um, we looked at some effects on saponification to see whether it was really detrimental. And for the most part, if it's done correctly, it's giving similar results to whenever we don't saponify. So we actually did this analysis on brain extract without saponification using normal phase HPLC. Um, those were the conditions. Um, this is a chromatogram of the tocopherol tocotrienol separation. We use fluorescence detection for that. This is a normal phase gradient separation, and uh, you see lutein, zeaxanthin here, and this is a brain extract. The hydrocarbon carotenes tend to come out together at the front. Um, we summary here that uh, MTBE and THF were best for extracting xanthophils, MTBE hexane best for carotenes and the tocopherols was uh, uh, a slightly different. So we used this multiple or series of solvent extractions. Um, this is just a C30 separation showing saponification. And that was done with and without saponification to look at some effects. And the last thing was to comment on the um, zeaxanthin optical isomers. I know Liz published this last year. and. Uh, I presented it before, but um, the only difference between these is whether these bonds are up or down. Sorry about this. I, I lost a slide last night, and I had to sort of create it. So there are three forms, RR, RS, and SS. And the chiral column is used for the separation. The zeaxanthin was collected by normal phase and then run on the chiral separation. and. Uh, what we have here is the mixture of zeaxanthin optical isomers. Here's lutein for reference. It comes out afterwards. And then this is the fraction from the brain so that we actually have the RR form and there's some lutein that was in that. And um, this last slide, sorry, is the data from the, the MAP study. And again, uh, what we see here, this is beta cryptoxanthin just slightly higher in the different regions. We have the IT, the MF, the putamen, and the ventral medial caudate labeled here. Lutein, uh, excuse me, beta cryptoxanthin the highest, lutein following, zeaxanthin here, and then alpha cryptoxanthin here. And I'm sorry for running over, and uh, I'll stop with that and take questions. <laughs> We, uh, we have yes, time sir. for just a couple of questions. Hi, thanks for your presentation. Uh, I didn't get it clear. I <clears throat> don't know if you extracted the carotenoids from brain uh, uh, saponifying and without saponification. Right. Well, in, in the very first study, it was a saponification process, but Anybody that's done it knows that you can create some artifacts in the process, and you have to exclude oxygen and incorporate an antioxidant. And so it hadn't been done um, really without saponification because by reverse phase, you can't load that much lipid on the column. So we did this study, the, the MAP study, without saponification using direct extraction, running it by normal phase, and we could actually inject it with the, the lipid content. So if there were xanthophil esters, for example, you wouldn't know that if you do a saponification. And so that was, you know, to get at some of these questions, you know, do we create any, any differential artifacts by doing a saponification versus not? Um, are there other things that might be present in there that we didn't see if we saponified? So then the, these carotenoids in brain are free. Right. From what we can see, there's no significant esterified form no, of... Esterification. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, hi. 
I'd like to ask you about uh, the regions you chose in the second set of data you have oh, here. I'm sorry. So it looks like you picked um, some of the striatum. Could you go back a few slides, if you don't mind? No. Yeah, I apologize. I had too much information. <laughs> so uh, the, yeah, that's it. Right here. OK. And, and I didn't pick this, by the way. I'm, I'm, just, the, I'm just the analytical chemistry group. The maps, uh, the people who, who designed the study chose these sections. Now, um, I know that they are interested in Alzheimer's disease. I know there's some interest in Parkinson's disease. And so um, the data has not been worked up to determine. Um, they actually have four levels of grading with regard to uh, cognitive function. And so when this data is completed, they'll be able to determine whether there's an effect of cognitive function, the grading on that, um, whether there are significant differences between you know, these regions. But this is all I could present to you at this point in time was just the, the means from the different, the different uh, sections and those particular uh, carot xanthophils. I see. I was interested in the caudate and the putamen because, um, well, it makes sense now that you said it's, uh, they're studying Parkinson's because those are kind of movement initiating centers in the brain. Yeah, uh, and I'm sure that there was a reason they chose those, uh, and I'm sure that part of it would be related to Alzheimer's disease, but Parkinson's, I know, is one of the issues that they're following, too. Great, thank so you. Maybe we have time for one more question. Neil. Yes, sir. Can you tell me how you controlled for the differences in size and lipid in these Alzheimer's and the healthy brains? Did you control by weight? Or did you have an internal standard at some sort? Okay, well, and I rushed through some of that. For the, uh, the normal phase data, we have two internal standards that we included uh, in the process. Um, the samples were by weight, and I guess that's one of the things. We, we were doing this, the first study, was one to three grams of material. We, we didn't realize it, but we had a, a lot of material. This was 100 milligrams or less for all the analysis that we did. Thank you very much. Thank you. So uh, 